Hi there. I'm running to you off some fresh tech and I wanted to show you this beautiful boy before I got started. This is Albert Einstein with some ripped dude's body. I hope you like it as much as I do. This is my vision board. I'm not sure if you're familiar with what a vision board is, but some people will create a board of images or imagery that they aspire to allow to entangle their soul, so to speak. And um, if you know anything about me, this that won't surprise you. This is basically uh, everything I dream about in life. This is what I want to become. All right. I'm not going to make you look at that beautiful body anymore because I'm zooming in. Biatch. What up? I have been thinking a lot lately about inspiring people because I'm realizing more and more, and it's like I keep re-realizing it I get, uh, in life. I think that's what that life is, is a set of re-realizations. Nothing's stagnant. Nothing's forever. Like nothing's, nothing hits you or, or affects you and then is done. And then it's like, that's it. You never have to experience that again. Like waves and cycles of remembrance. And one thing I'm reminded of is how your words inspire people big time. Like telling your friends something has the ability to alter that person that then they may go tell 10 million people that. And like little thing, I mean, just, just casual conversation can, we change each other so much so rapidly and so readily. And like, we're so interconnected with the internet that that these little conversations can have such resounding impacts. And now more than ever, it's like it's the 60s all over again. I mean, it's 2020, but it's like the year that would be. You know, this is with COVID sticking everybody inside and everybody panicking and the WHO saying, you don't have to wear masks if you're not a professional, but then the the, the CDC of the United States saying you should wear a mask when you are. And everyone's like, I'm, conf I don't, I'm fucking confused right now. Uh, but then they're telling you stay inside. We're going to print trillions and trillions of dollars um, and inflate the economy. You're going to lose your job, but don't go outside looking for another job. There are no job. We're making sure it's like, this is driving people to the brink of insanity. And then you see this guy gets his knee, the knee on his neck and, and it's, it's George, uh, I really should know his name by now. This dude, if you didn't see it, I mean, uh, at this point, you probably know what's going on. But this this cop, they were arresting this dude, George something. God forgive me that I don't remember his last name because it should be a household name by now. I know the other guy's, the cop's name is Chauvin, though his last name. Derek Chauvin is his name. And he was putting his knee on this dude's neck. And the guy's like, I can't breathe, man. I can't breathe. And he's like on the ground for eight minutes. The cop has his fucking knee in this guy's neck on it, on the back, on like his cardio artery, you know, blocking out blood flow. And the guy's like screams out for his mom at one point, And he's like yelling for his dog. I, I, to be honest, I didn't watch all. I can't even, I wasn't able to find the eight minutes of the guy of the knee on the neck, but I've saw a lot of video of the, the, time leading up to it when the cops claimed that he was resisting arrest. And at one point I was like, it looks like he is resisting because he was like kind of pushing against them as they were pushing him towards the cop car, but that's not real resistance. And so this Chauvin guy arrived on the scene and hadn't seen anything building up to this point. And the cops were like, he was resisting arrest. So Chauvin was like, oh yeah. Now I heard that he, he, the guy was already in the cop car. The cop pulled him back out of the car, put him on the ground, put his knee in his neck. Turns out that this cop and this, this guy, Derek, uh, were not Derek, Derek and, um, the guy, you know, I'm going to look up his name because this is, this is really sick and sad that I don't remember it right now. Just go to the internet and type riot and you're going to, his name's going to pop up immediately. Oh, maybe I should type in instead of riot. Let's go for protest. George Floyd. Remember it. I'm talking to myself here, but I'm talking to you. Remember George. Just, so George is like, apparently Derek and George work together as security guards in this in this club. And maybe they knew each other. Ultimately, it doesn't fucking matter. The cop for eight minutes had his knee in this guy's neck and he died. He killed the guy. He murdered. I mean, I, I think he fucking murdered the guy. 
and he was arrested and charged with murder, third degree murder and manslaughter. And it's got like a 25 year sentence that this thing, that this charge carries. So global, well, national protests have erupted and it's like Rodney King, the Rodney King beatings in like I will, uh, the early nineties, I think in Los Angeles, except this time it's got the fucking internet. And so everyone saw it. And when one riot went crazy in Minneapolis, Minnesota, you know, three, three nights ago, everybody saw it and emulated it. Riots in Los Angeles, riots in Atlanta, riots in Philadelphia, riots, like smashing windows, burning buildings, fucking burning cars. I think a cop got stabbed in the neck. Somebody got shot with a sword. Someone who had a sword and got fucking attacked. I don't know the amount of, it's like, it's crazy, right? No, people don't. No, it's like coming out who died, what's going on. There's a video of these cops walking down the street and they're like, get inside, get inside. And the girl's out on her front porch recording. They're like, get inside. And she doesn't. So they shoot her with paint, like paint bullets. The cops are shooting at civilians on their porch because they're trying to, you know, enforce a curfew or the cops are afraid that the civilians on the porch are going to, who knows? It's like the boiling point because people have been locked inside and going crazy and losing their jobs on top of police brutality and just inconceivable allowance of the brutality. Like, you know, Chauvin murdered this guy and then a day went by and, and they were like, this guy killed this guy. And then a day went by and no one, or no one arrested him. And only after the fucking riots broke out, did the mayor come and, issue this guy's arrest and it's like capitulation almost so did, did, did they and it's like do they even want to arrest the guy no one know you know, like and it's like it didn't appease the rioters because at that point you failed to do your job by taking by pointing out that that was wrong immediately if you saw the video you know he's got his hand in his pocket and he's just like knee on the neck it's brutal it is a blatant careless act by a cop and there were other cops standing by watching and they're they're on leave or reprimanded. I don't know. I don't think they're arrested yet. If if they are going to be, I don't know. But this is like a deeper issue. This is this speaks to a lot of things. It speaks to for me inconsistency of being there for people. I've been fucking silent on these issues and it's it's driving myself and the people around me insane because I need to be speaking my mind. You need to be speaking your mind. We need to be speaking our mind. We have a First Amendment in the United States, which allows us to stand up, which allows us to speak a lot of fucking bullshit truth in public, like loud, angry stuff that power doesn't want to hear. They get to hear it because of whatever because of our, our four you know these these men these men and women that came before us that created this amazing democracy this incredible constitution that gives us this power of the first amendment the freedom of speech and that's the number one thing we should be doing is exercising that and it goes to the to the the poverty the class war i mean it's a class warfare system right now I, i'm working from home and I feel like I'm in it, you know, I can't quite get out of it and be like, yeah, we should go back to work because I'm like, well, that go back to work for me means still sit at home and work while other people have to go out there in the, in the pandemic right now. So like, but deep down, I want the economy to, to get back to action and, and I think that wealthy people have the option of kind of saying, yeah, yeah, go no, Yeah, no, yeah, no. Like, I mean, they, they'd rather see it opened at the, at the behest or the peril of the people that have to actually go out and, and go into a building and work with a bunch of other people and become, you know, potentially contaminated with viral load and whatever the case. I don't know how big of a deal this, this COVID-19 thing is for real. I've heard that vitamin D is a big, way to treat it and to prevent it and to so so i think that we should be looking more at physical health and uh, preventing you know enhancing your immune system and preventing disease in general eating the right foods that vegetable, green vegetables with that magnesium and cutting down on your sugar uh and and I'm like fake shit like high fructose corn syrup and aspartame get that shit out of your fucking diet just 
go healthy. See how healthy you can get. And that's, if anything, what this virus is teaching me right now. It's the, this, the class war. I mean, the world is at the most imbalanced economic situation it's, to my knowledge, ever been at. And I, I'm, I'm at the luxury of saying the world because it seems like we're pretty much unified. You know, there are like tribes and small areas of the planet that aren't connected on this grid right now, but we have this like web of, of humans. And there are so many multi, like hundreds of, I think Bezos now is worth, he was 120 billion before he got divorced. Uh, then he, he, he split it in half with his wife. They each got like, you know, whatever, 60 billion, 80 billion, I don't know. So he's worth something. Amazon stocks are up like, I don't know what percent, but they're up since the COVID epidemic has broken out. Amazon, the wealthiest fucking owner in the world, is now richer because we've all been sheltered in place and have to order our stuff online. So you see the wealth disparity even more. And whether or not it's a black and white thing, I know that race plays an issue. And because I, I was born as a Irish german dude with light skin pink skin or whatever i haven't had to suffer the things that people with other colored darker skins have had to suffer in this society and i know because i went to south america and i lived there and i felt so fucking uncomfortable sometimes i the way people will stare at you when you don't look like them and you are treated as different because you are different and that's just genetically you're different and it's 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 exhausting I wanted to leave. I wanted to go home. I just wanted to be accepted. I wanted to, I wanted people to look past me when they looked at me, not just, and it was, it was, I get it. I mean, I got it, but not at the level of people that are born and have to live with it every day and don't have a home. Like that is their home that I've never experienced. That's there, but it's a class thing. It's a, it's a money thing. Like if you don't have the money, to buy the stuff you need, then you're gonna go fucking loot it. If you don't have food, you're gonna go take it. I like UBI. I like the concept. And it's funny that the, the people in, in, in government are like talking about, oh, maybe we should do uh, like a monthly stipend now that this COVID thing's working. Like, what the fuck? Andrew Yang has been talking about this for like a year and people barely give him the time of day. Now all of a sudden it's like, mm, let's, um, oh, I have an idea. Let yeah, yeah, basic income would be nice. It would give people the opportunity to not have to go out and steal a fucking bike if they don't have wheels. It's important that you say these kinds of things to each other. At least, at least put them on a video and document them and then put it online or something so that you can, people can see it that way. If you don't have someone with you to talk to about it. it and sometimes, you know, sometimes it can get heated because if you're going to talk to someone about it, then you kind of have a right or an obligation to listen to them talk to you about it. And that can escalate a situation. It can cause different chemical reactions because it's not just you spewing, which is, you know, it's a comfortable unknown. You know the parameters when you're about to explode your verbs all over someone, your verbiage. But when someone else is in the room, they will drastically take it and twist it and change the response, which then alters the way you function. And, it, and then that can be unsettling. So it can lead to an argument, so to speak. Doesn't always, you know, and oftentimes it doesn't, but it can. And, and that can be frustrating to get into it with someone that, you know, if you have different views on the epidemic or on, on race relations or on what the cause of the tensions in society are right now, you know, it takes a lot of listening. There's a lot of listening involved and it can be a slow conversation. Like sometimes it can take weeks to have a conversation with someone. You have it bit by bit, 20 minutes, like two minutes a day. You get like some, some shots fired. Each person gets some, some knowledge data f dropped out and then you go on to the next thing because you're busy. But over time you're able to work and slowly change each other. That's probably more common than we realize. And sometimes you have the the opportunity or or the um, you know the 
the lucky, I guess you call it an opportunity to have a long conversation with someone. And those are great. Those are really powerful to, to be able to, to be able to talk to someone. I mean, we are lucky that we have each other in humans and that we're connected. This, this tribal unification that we have on this grand scale is, is, is unique. We, we used to have to go to bed without electricity in the dark and, and hope that we didn't get attacked by animals and had parasites from the shitty food we ate and other countries and people will come and take our, our spouses, murder our men and rape our women and imprison our children and brainwash them to become like them. And, and I mean, this is this horrible history. And now we're in this beautiful society where we can talk to each other. And have these amazing, you can go to a store and have a conversation with a store, like a, a cashier, just someone you've never seen before and just crack up like this, no fear conversations this from, from the base, you know, just have like, say the wildest shit to each other. And you know, it's okay because of the first, we got the protection of the first amendment. That's then backed up by the protection of the second amendment. And like an armed society is a polite society. You don't fuck with the armed society, man. And it just makes me think, feel, think that we feel, feel and think that we have to use it, that we're obliged to. It's not, it's not, how is this put? You're not being egotistical if you speak your truth. In fact, you're being egotistical if you don't. If you don't say what you think or what you feel, you're allowing your ego to suppress yourself. And that's the worst form of egoism, man. You need to let yourself be. And I think society will be way better off. We can inspire each other to do this. Little kids, adults. I mean, we're all kind of just little kids at heart and big bodies or little bodies. I ain't judging. Yo, bro. Before I go, I just want to give you a chance to say goodbye to Albie again. He'll be back. And so will I.